You're listening to the Dental Zone podcast. I'm Dr. Rachel Hall. This is the place that supports you to understand your dental issues, the causes and how to prevent them, empowering each individual to get the most out of life while bearing a stunning smile. Hello, I'm Dr. Rachel Hall. This is The Dental Zone. I'm a holistic dentist from Brisbane, Australia. Thank you so much for joining me on today's show. This is the place where I like to discuss topics that are relevant to not only your dental health, but your overall health and well-being based on what's going on in your mouth or how things in your body affect your teeth and gums. I've been focusing recently again on dental amalgam and mercury and the effects that that has on your health and well-being. I've been exposing some of the narrative and the science and the stances of the dental profession in regards to this dubious material that we've been using to fill patients' teeth for a couple of hundred years. And today I'm going to focus on the actual symptoms that you get from mercury toxicity. But before I do that, if you want to know more about holistic dentistry and what that is and why that's important to you and why you might want to be utilizing the services of a holistic dentist, then hop on over to holisticdentistry.au. But for now, let's get in the zone. So let's look at the symptoms of mercury toxicity. Now, I have a very long list here. I have it written down, so I do apologize if you can hear me rustling papers again. This is not just me. This is not anecdotal. This is contained in the medical literature and many textbooks. It's going to be a long list, um, so bear with me. The reason I'm doing this is because... Mercury doesn't cause one specific illness or set of symptoms that you can go, ah, you have X, Y, Z and A, B, C. Therefore, that must mean you've got mercury toxicity. The problem with something like mercury, it affects nearly every single system and biochemical process of the body. And therefore... It causes a vast array of symptoms, and those symptoms are going to differ from individual to individual, depending on kind of our inherent, say, weaknesses or areas of impact. So I'm going to break it down into kind of different systems or different areas of the body so that we can just quickly list some of these issues Now, when I first came across this, this would have been probably eight or nine years into my career after, as many traditionally trained dentists, I'd been handling dental amalgam, um, just as dentists normally do, and exposing myself, unbeknownst to me at the time, to quite high levels of mercury from occupational exposure. And when I started reading these lists and seeing these things about mercury, I was actually quite shocked how many of my own, what I would have called subliminal or low grade and not so overt health symptoms and some more overt, I was like, I have that, I have that, and I have that. And I started joining the dots and going, oh my goodness, this could be because of mercury and not because of stress or all the other things that I was trying to justify it from. So let's get into it. Let's look at the toxic effects of elemental mercury vapor exposure. So we're going to look at the psychological disturbances, things like irritability, nervousness, shyness, loss of memory, lack of attention, loss of self-confidence, decline of intellect, lack of self-control, fits of anger, depression, anxiety, drowsiness, insomnia. Now, when I had high mercury levels, I used to kind of slightly tongue-in-cheek joke that I didn't have road rage, I had life rage. And so if I looked at this, I mean, yep, lack of self-control, fits of anger, anxiety, irritability, nervousness, and I did have have short-term memory loss, 
I also suffered from fatigue, but insomnia on top of that. Oral cavity disorders, so things that mercury does to your mouth. This is a bit ironic, causes bleeding gums. So you could be told, hey, you've got gum disease, you don't have any plaque or tartar, you don't have all the usual indicators, yet your gums bleed, could be mercury toxicity, bone loss from around the teeth, loosening of the teeth, excessive salivation, foul or bad breath, metallic taste, leukoplakia, which means white patches inside your mouth, gingivitis, which is inflammation of the gums, mouth inflammation, ulceration, burning sensation in the mouth or throat, and changes in the tissue pigmentation. Gastrointestinal effects, abdominal cramps, constipation or diarrhea, GI problems including colitis and irritable bowel, cardiovascular health, irregular heartbeat, feeble and irregular pulse, alterations in blood pressure, pain or pressure in chest. Now I used to suffer from extreme heart palpitations. I used to think it was stress. I used to think it was all the caffeine that I was drinking because I was so fatigued. But possibly, again, from mercury, because once I stopped using amalgam and I did a mercury detox and I practiced smart, safe amalgam removal, where not only do I shield the patient from mercury exposure, but myself and my team, my irregular heartbeats and palpitations just stopped. Join the dots. Neurological issues, chronic or frequent headaches, dizziness, ringing or noises in the ears, so tinnitus, fine tremors of the hands, feet, lips, eyelid, and even tongue. Respiratory or chest, persistent cough, emphysema, and shallow or irregular breathing. Immunological, allergies, asthma, hay fever, sinusitis, lymphadenopathy, which is swollen glands, especially in the neck region. Again, I used to get hay fever, really bad asthma, used to get sinusitis all the time. Yes, all stopped once I cleared mercury from my system. Endocrine, this is your hormone system. Subnormal, which is low body temperature, cold, clammy skin, especially of the hands and feet, excessive perspiration or sweating. And then others, muscle weakness, speech disorders, dim or double vision, fatigue, anemia, hypoxia, which is low oxygen, edema, which is swelling, loss of appetite, loss of weight, joint pains. I used to have terrible joint and muscle pains. And in severe cases of mercury exposure, uh, hallucinations and manic depression. Then let's look at organic mercury exposure. Some of the earliest symptoms that people get are fatigue, headache, forgetfulness, inability to concentrate, apathy, which is, you know, can't be bothered, burnout type symptoms, depression, outbursts of anger and decline of intellect. Then later findings as the exposure has continued and the mercury stays within the body, numbness and tingling of the hands, feet and lips, muscle weakening, dim or restricted vision, hearing difficulty, speech disorders, loss of memory and incoordination, emotional instability, dermatitis, kidney damage, and central nervous system dysfunction. So you can see that there's quite significant and profound and across the board impacts of mercury exposure. And this is documented in medical literature. This is very well known. And most of these symptoms that I've listed were derived from people who had suffered from either chronic or acute industrial exposure to mercury. The study of 
micromercularialism, that's a bit of a tongue twister, which is low level exposure, which is what you get from dental amalgam, continuous low level exposure. There's been very limited study in the scientific literature. However, there is significant evidence to suggest that continual exposure to small doses of mercury over long periods of time can produce many of the symptoms that I've just listed. After all, it's the same biochemical pathways in the human physiology that get affected by larger doses of mercury that result in these clinical observable symptoms. It's got to be that these same symptoms are also affected by low continuous mercury exposure, regardless of the source of the mercury. Since inorganic mercury in some body tissues has a half-life of over 25 years, particularly in the brain, and this means that it takes the body 25 years to get rid of half of a single dose exposure. It is only a matter of time and degree of exposure until some sort of symptoms have to appear. Now, if you have an acute exposure to mercury, these symptoms appear quite rapidly. If you have a chronic long-term exposure, which is the nature of the exposure of dental amalgam, where from chewing, grinding, heat, friction, and just breakdown of the filling, Mercury vapor is released every day like a drip feed, like a tap that's dripping constantly into your body. So it starts to accumulate. So over the time period that those fillings are in your mouth and afterwards, because the mercury has got to come out of the body, it could be that you had fillings placed as a teenager or as a young adult and you don't start getting symptoms until... 10, 20, 30 years later. By that time, how are you going to correlate and put two and two together that, ah, I had a filling and now I don't feel well? We don't join the dots. We're not looking at it this way. The medical fraternity, the dental fraternity, the professions, they're not back chaining and going, hang on, this person's got metal amalgam fillings in their teeth and they have these symptoms that tick the list of mercury exposure. No, what you're told is it's your age. It's part of the natural aging process, or it's just, we don't know. We don't know why you've got an autoimmune condition. We don't know why you've got trouble with your thyroid. We don't know why you're fatigued. It's your hormones, it's this, that, and the other. All the throwaway lines and commentaries that get given because we're not being taught to question or look for mercury toxicity. So if you've got dental amalgams, it's only a matter of time before you're going to start getting some of these symptoms. But who's going to join the dots and say, oh, I get fatigue, I get regular headaches, I can't concentrate, I feel angry and moody. Oh, maybe that's mercury. No, you're told you're depressed, here's an antidepressant, get on with your life. Unfortunately, this happens, uh, and unfortunately, mercury is so toxic to the human being that there can actually be cell death or irreversible chemical damage long before you get clinical symptoms that indicate that something is wrong. You could be experiencing some of the symptoms from mercury release from amalgam fillings, but since the exposure, as I've just been talking about, is so gradual And because the time between the placement of the fillings and the onset of the symptoms can vary so dramatically from days to years based on your own biochemical makeup and sensitivity, it's not readily apparent or identifiable as being associated with dental mercury. Under these conditions, your doctor's going to have a real difficult time relating your subclinical symptoms, which are not readily apparent or identifiable as being associated with a particular disease or health problem, to mercury toxicity. And this is not a new hypothesis. A German chemist, uh, what was his name? Alfred. Alfred Stock, I think his name was. He 
determined in 1926. The dentists are seldom in a position to recognise the general effects of amalgam fillings or even learn about them. Patients suffering from nervousness, intellectual exhaustion, mucus buildup, usually do not complain to the dentist. In addition, they are prevented from talking during the treatment. They will rather discuss their problems with the family doctor, neurologist, um, ear, nose and throat specialist than they would with their dentist. The same difficulty in diagnosis exists within the dental profession with regard to what we call periodontal or gum disease. Traditionally, simple periodontal disease, periodontitis, has been related to a variety of local in, in, irritants. <laughs> Having trouble getting my words out today. I must slow down a little bit. Hang on. Let me just take a breath. Got a lot to say. I want, want to get through I want to get through this for you. So gum disease has been related to local factors such as plaque below the gum line, uh, food impaction and buildup, rough edges of fillings, and the textbooks and scientific literature have actually established that mercury and or amalgam fillings can pathologically damage your gum tissue and the bone that holds your teeth in. Except, you know what? Guess what? Never told that in my dental training. So if I was never told that, you can pretty much bet that every other single dentist was never told that either. So some of the symptoms that I talked about under oral cavity disorders are considered classical symptoms of mercury toxicity, yet very few gum specialists or dentists recognize that mercury from dental amalgam fillings is a causing factor for the development of gum disease. So we've got all these patients that we're treating for gum disease, gum disease that's not getting better, gum disease that's not stabilizing, gum disease that's progressively destroying the structures that hold our patient's teeth in, and we're busy scaling and cleaning teeth, giving oral hygiene instruction, brush, floss, don't eat sugar, use this math, rinse, use this, use that, and it's not working. And it's not working because we're not addressing the underlying issue, being mercury toxicity. There was a lot of debate that's taken place around this list of symptoms. And the American Dental Association said, you know, sensitivity. Patients get sensitivity. And this kind of detracts from what actually occurs in the human body that gets exposed to chronic inhalation of mercury. It's not sensitivity to mercury, guys. It's not an allergy, but it's rather that you're suffering from toxicity, or let's go there, poisoning. People with dental amalgam are being mercury poisoned. Mercury is such an insidious poison. It attacks various biochemical functions of the human body, causing a myriad of deficiencies, leading to discernible health problems, only one of which may be an allergic reaction to mercury. It has been scientifically established that mercury is more neurotoxic than arsenic and far more neurotoxic than lead. In the medical consideration of poisoning from arsenic or lead, would the determination be based solely on the patient's allergy to the substances? No, I don't think so. Would the medical profession dismiss a patient's proven continuous daily exposure to arsenic or lead unless the patient were to demonstrate that they were allergic to the substance? No. To dismiss out of hand the continuous daily exposure to highly toxic mercury vapour released from amalgam dental fillings based only on relating it to hypersensitivity, aka allergy, presents serious ethical considerations. And it just begs the question, why? 
Why are we ignoring this as a factor in people's health and well-being? Why is it that unless you see a naturopath or an integrative GP or a really switched on health practitioner, not one of them is going to say to you, hey, do you have mercury fillings? Do you have amalgam in your teeth? Let me have a look, open up. Oh yeah, you've got amalgam fillings. Well, look, I'm going to test for mercury toxicity or I suspect mercury toxicity. I'm going to recommend that you go speak to a holistic dentist. We get those fillings out of your teeth and then we do a heavy metal detox. No, it doesn't happen, does it? You go and you get a a tablet or you get tests and they go, we don't know what's wrong with you. You're making it up, it's all in your head. Well, yes, it is in your head. It's in your freaking teeth. Okay, if you've been mercury poisoned, then, you know, it's hard to prove. It's hard to prove the link between the fillings because we're not looking for it. So you might be sitting here going, okay, Rachel, you've given me this whole list of things. You're getting (laughs) a little bit heated because, yeah, it bothers me. It upsets me. It upsets me that people's health and well-being is being put in jeopardy and we're not doing enough about it. So you might be asking, would replacing my amalgam dental fillings improve my health and would it reduce my health care costs? Would it mean that I don't have to be at the doctor all the time? Does it mean I don't have to be on medications or having all these issues, taking time off work, uh, the impact on the quality of my life? Well, there hasn't been any large-scale scientific studies done that I could say to you this will give you a definitive establishment uh, acceptable answer to the question. However, there have been a number of small studies and the results from these studies all indicated a positive health benefit from having the fillings removed and having the elimination of these mercury-containing dental fillings drip-feeding into your body. The vast majority of individuals who have undergone amalgam replacement and the reduction of their mercury body burden have experienced improvements in health that have ranged from minor to what I would call startling dramatic. And I will just run through this quickly, but... In my own practice, when I first started not using amalgam and doing amalgam removal for patients, these patients would come back and see me, you know, for their six-month review. And I'd see them and I'd go, oh, my gosh, you're looking really well. And I would notice changes in their persona, you know, colour of their skin and eyes, the level of vitality, their level of switched onness. They, A lot of them were who were quite difficult people because of their level of aggression and irritability, they would be, they would have almost like personality changes as well as health changes. And I would ask them, hey, what have you been doing? You're you're looking amazing. And they'd go, you removed removed my amalgam filling stock to Rachel. And I'm like, yeah, I know that, but what have you been doing? They'd go, you removed my amalgam filling stock to Rachel. And I'd be like, oh, So you're saying that all this has happened because I removed your amalgam fillings? And they're like, yeah. And at first, I was a bit shocked and taken aback and like, wow, really? But the more I saw this, the more I couldn't deny it. And also during this time in the first sort of 12 months of me not handling amalgam and working more safely with it, my symptoms reduced. My body burden of mercury was starting to reduce. And then this led me to being a really big advocate of amalgam-free and amalgam-safe dentistry or dentistry without mercury. Um, And because of that, I went and got a heavy metal detox done for myself so that I could really shift the stuff from my body. And so it's, yes, I could say that's anecdotal. Yes, you could say it's placebo. But if people feel better... They feel better, and that to me is a really positive outcome. Yes, unfortunately, getting dentistry done is not cheap, but what price are you going to pay by leaving that dental amalgam in your teeth when you hear that list of symptoms? 
So this was a study done of nearly 2,000 patients before and after elimination of their amalgam mercury containing fillings. So we just look at a couple of these things, otherwise, you know, it's going to get a bit tedious going through the list. But of those who reported anxiety, 93% said they felt an improvement after removal of fillings. 45 um, out of those who had fatigue, 86% noted improvement. 83% with gastrointestinal problems said they improved. 94% of patients with gum problems improved. 87% with headaches, including migraines, improved. Insomnia, 78% improved. Irregular heartbeat, 87% of the people said they had improved. Irritability, 90% of the people. Lack of concentration, 80%. Lack of energy, 97% said they got an improvement. Muscle tremor, 83%. Sore throat, 86% improvement. It's, it's, it's just phenomenal. You cannot argue with those statistics. Of those patients who were tested, every single one of them said they had improvement in not one, but nearly all of their symptoms. Nearly all of them improved. And let's look at allergy, because this is the one that the Dental Association wants to, you know, hone in on and say, oh, no, 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 you only have problems with mercury if you're actually allergic to it. Um, those with allergy, all improved. So when we look at the symptoms, the question is not whether the patient's allergic to dental amalgam, but what's really going on? You know, the fact is that if you're poisoned by mercury, from your dental fillings, then you are a lot more likely to be allergic to food, chemicals, and environmental factors because mercury is playing havoc with your immune system. Not surprising. Let's look at this from another perspective. You know, if you're hypersensitive or allergic to mercury, then you may be at much greater risk from exposure to the microdoses of mercury vapor escaping from your dental fillings. But there are many ways an individual can become sensitized for mercury. Um, it was used quite extensively in the medical profession in antifungal preparations, diuretics, antiseptics, and even in brain scans, they used to use radioactive mercury. And then um, there were first aid treatments that were given that also had mercury in. So mercury is in many foods we eat. It's also in contained in over-the-counter drugs and cosmetics. It was in mascaras, uh, hemorrhoid preparations. And so you can get sensitized from mercury from many sources. Thankfully, a lot of those sources now that were a bit more progressive have been reduced. So how can you find out if the mercury coming out of your filling is harming you or if you're hypersensitive to it and that's a really big question that we're confronted with there's no easy answer a lot of the tests like blood tests and urine tests for mercury are not really a valid means of determining safe exposure and danger levels it's not also a very good way of testing for your mercury levels because Mercury doesn't stay in your blood and your urine. It goes into your tissues and cells, as was proven by the research studies that were done on sheep, etc. But there is overwhelming scientific evidence that indicate that blood and urine tests are invalid for determining toxicity or cell cellular damage that's occurring in the body. But they do, however, indicate a level of exposure to mercury. There are tests like hair strand analysis that you can do. Again, they can be quite subjective. And what I basically say to my patients is, look, 
if you've got amalgam in your teeth, you've got mercury in your body, um, do we really need to know what the levels are? Do we really need to prove that it's there? For some people, they do need that information and that's fine. But majority of my patients are just like, look, I understand the risks of this stuff. I've done my own research. I've done my reading. I'd like it gone. So one of the standard methods to look for hypersensitivity is the use of skin testing. So they do what they call a prick test. So they use a, a dilute concentration of the allergen. Uh, it's put on either with a patch or pricked onto the skin. And then, you know, does this really work? Is, is it really the best way to do it? And really, do you want to do this? Because you're putting mercury in, onto your skin or into your system, and that can increase your symptoms and reaction if you're already sensitive to mercury. Another problem stems from the difference of opinion amongst medical allergists and dermatologists as to what type of mercury to test with and how dilute to make the solution. There's also controversy around what kind of reaction constitutes a positive reaction to say you're allergic. Some say you're positive if your skin turns red and, and gets burny, itchy and swells. Others say that there are systemic manifestations such as changes in your blood pressure, temperature and pulse. Regardless of the correct interpretation of mercury patch testing, there are certain individuals who shouldn't be patch tested. Like if you're pregnant, you've got um, lupus, multiple sclerosis, uh, ALS, Alzheimer's disease, leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, cardiovascular disease, mental illness, Kawasaki's disease. Uh, if you suspect you're a sensitive to mercury, don't be tested for it with a skin test, uh, patch test, unless it's considered absolutely necessary. And I really can't see any instance that it would be. Perhaps someday that we'll get a, a, a proper development of a, a testing pro protocol. But until that time, we don't think that you should have additional exposure to test to see if your exposure is making you sensitive. Um, there are electrical measuring devices similar to like a voltmeter that can demonstrate you have electrical current in your mouth, but that's all they can do. They've got no diagnostic value for determining whether you're at risk or, that or not. Um, but those electrical currents are capable of causing unexplained pain, alterations, symptoms, and inflammation. Um, the holistic fraternity of dentists used to be really big on testing for these currents. Um, there was no logic to it whatsoever. It was basically, oh, look, that one's got a big current. We'll do that filling first because that one's got the most activity. Uh, there was nothing behind it, but it was a, it was a... It was a fun thing to do to prove that these things had electrical currents, but there was no, no diagnostic benefit and no rationale behind it. So I don't think it's needed. Um, yeah. But yeah, we can prove that your, your teeth do conduct uh, electrical currents. There is another um, category of electrical device that is kind of used within acupuncture to look at the energy flow in meridians. And again, I just don't see how it correlates to show that there is mercury um, actual release and as a diagnostic tool. We're looking uh, scientifically to see if there's some sort of enzyme system in the body that you can use to evaluate blood, urine or saliva to show that the mercury is inhibiting this particular type of enzyme and its metabolic function in the body. Um, but again, nothing's really been tested. The best and the closest test, I think, at this moment in time is what's called a porphyrin profile test for mercury. That probably gives us an idea of what's going on a bit more in the body because porphyrins are a kind of marker that show you are being exposed to heavy metals. There is what we call a Jerome mercury vapor analyzer, and this can be used to measure the amount of mercury vapor present in the mouth before and after chewing. 
Um, patients get asked to chew sugarless gum for 10 minutes and then they do another reading. So they do a reading before, get them to chew the gum and do a reading after. But this, again, only shows release at the time. There's been some equations developed that go, okay, if this is how much has been in your mouth, we can extrapolate this and say this is probably how much mercury you're getting in your body. The results of mercury vapor readings are good for the following reasons, though. It demonstrates that mercury vapor is coming out of the amalgam fillings and being inhaled. And we know that mercury vapor is a serious poison. We also know that mercury vapor is inhaled into the lungs and is absorbed almost 100%. It then immediately passes into the bloodstream. In its elemental mercury vapor state, it takes approximately four minutes before it's converted or oxidized into its ionic state. While in its elemental form, mercury vapor is fat soluble and readily passes through the blood brain barrier to your brain or the placental membrane to the unborn baby. It also accumulates in other organs and tissues of the body. Autop studies of humans studying um, suffering accidental death were done in Germany, Sweden, and the United States. And all of these studies showed a positive correlation between the number of amalgam surfaces and fillings in the mouth and the degree of accumulation of mercury in the brain. So essentially, the more fillings you have, the more surfaces of your teeth that are filled, the more accumulation of mercury you're going to have in your brain. We can look at complete blood count. This is a routine blood test um, prescribed by many doctors. Your white blood cell count variations can either be up or down and have been found in cases of known mercury poisoning. There can be suppression of the T lymphocytes, both by dental amalgam and dental nickel. And studies have been done that clearly demonstrate that mercury-containing compounds adversely affect the immune system, that they decrease the white blood cell function following exposure to mercury. And this indicates that mercury is immunotoxic at very low levels. These lymphocyte and monocyte cells contain, um, control your body's immunity. And accordingly, tests could prove quite helpful in arriving at diagnosis. The most single diagnostic at all available at this present time is you. You are your best diagnostic tool. You know your medical history. And with your medical history, you can assist us, your holistic dentist, by providing us with all the details of your medical history um, and symptoms. And this, this can help us join the dots of any medical problems or symptoms that you've had that we can go, hmm, you're ticking a lot of boxes for these symptoms that relate to mercury toxicity. It's important that we're thorough and we get that information. State whether you have any allergies, particularly to metals. If you're contemplating having your mercury-containing fillings replaced with non-mercury-containing materials, it's very important that we know exactly what's going on with your state of being. And I will probably co cover that in more detail in a, another episode. So... There are a lot of symptoms that can be caused by dental amalgam. I've gone through them quite quickly here, but you can go back and re-listen. I wonder if this has caused you to have a few aha moments like it did for me when I first started looking at this list. And that list is not exhaustive. Um, I'm just trying to give you a, a brief overview because otherwise we'd be here for hours and hours going over it. But if you're starting to join the dots and go, hang on a minute, I have this, that, and the other, and I have amalgam fillings, or mum had amalgam fillings while she was pregnant and breastfeeding me, then I would encourage you to seriously look at your mercury burden, your heavy metal burden, and have a discussion with a smart, certified holistic dentist. 
it's important that they're smart certified because that means that if you do go ahead with amalgam replacement, it's going to be done safely for you. And SMART stands for Safe Mercury Amalgam Removal Technique, which means they're going to follow all the protocols and have all the equipment that's needed to ensure you don't get mercury exposure at the time. It also means they're going to use good quality materials to replace your fillings so that you're not swapping one toxic filling material for another. But if you're starting to join the dots and go, hang on a minute, I've got a lot of these symptoms, then I would encourage you to seek the support of a good integrative GP, uh, a naturopath who understands about mercury and heavy metal toxicity, and a holistic dentist to get rid of the amalgam fillings from your teeth and the mercury and heavy metals from your body. If you'd like to know more, or you live in the Brisbane area or are able to travel, then our office phone number is 07 three seven two zero one eight one one or you can reach out info at holistic and i will be really happy to see you consult with you um, for amalgam removal have a look at what's happening come up with a treatment plan and devise the best way forward to help you rid that mercury from your system thank you so much for joining me today another kind of very information heavy um episode today but very important that we talk about these things and we bring it out into the open what is actually going on and that your symptoms that you're experiencing could have a causative factor that you can do something about. I'm Dr Rachel Hall, holistic dentist. This is The Dental Zone. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next time, stay in the zone. You've been listening to the Dental Zone podcast with Dr. Rachel Hall. For health, lifestyle, fitness, and a great smile, get in the zone.